Welcome to Grace. Welcome to the Wednesday night service. We are excited that everybody's here. Who is ready to worship? All right, let's stand up. We're going to get right into worship. The altars are open. Feel free to come up and worship with us.
Thank you, Jesus. 
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all and all thrones and dominions all powers and position your name stands above them all and the angels cry in hope Praise the 
Lord. Give thanks. God, we give thanks to you. Lord, you are good. You are steadfast in your love for us. It endures forever. You are worthy of our praise. We will sing of your goodness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for meeting us here. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed in this place. We honor you with our worship. We honor you with our word tonight, God. Just anoint every word that is spoken. Fill us and change us. <laughs> May we never be the same. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We love you, Father. This is your service. You are worthy, God. We love you. We praise you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday night midweek service. It's good to see everybody. Are y'all excited to be here? Okay. Are y'all excited to be here? Yeah. yeah. All right. We're going to release all youth and kids, radical kids and radical youth. As y'all know, Pastor Jeremy and Danielle are out of town, but they will be back here on Sunday. We're very excited for them, and I know they're having a great time. Um, this Sunday is our men and women's Bible study at 6 p.m. Everybody say, this Sunday at 6 p.m. is our men's and women's Bible study. We encourage you to come and connect and study the Word together. I know it blesses all the women that come for the Wednesday night, or for the Sunday, Wednesday Bible study. Um, so definitely come. You'll be blessed to be around people. Um, we have Grace Moms. This is a new group, August 23rd at 6 p.m. This was put on my heart a long, long time ago, um, and it's kind of been in the works. We will be getting together. It's for all moms, whoever wants to come and get encouraged and be put in the Word, and just really know who you are in Christ as a mom. Um, there was a time and I'm going to go into my testimony on Friday evening. Um, it'll be at my house, so if y'all want to come, please get with me after service, and I can give you our address. Um, Aaron has blessed us with food and uh, beverages, so thank you so much for that, providing that for us. But um, there was a time where I didn't feel worthy enough um, as a mom, and I really got into the Word, got into prayer, and really found out who I was in Jesus, and so this is what that's going to be about, just getting into the work, connecting with other moms, knowing you're not alone, and you can do it with Jesus and with a bunch of faith-filled women. So um, tonight is going to be great, and you will be encouraged, and we are going to welcome Paul to come up and share the word with us this evening. Well, good evening. Isn't it good to be here? And I don't just say that to say that because that's what people are supposed to say when they come up in front of the church. But I love the church. I love, I'm really partial to this church. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of y'all, but this is family. Me and Keith were talking about it a while ago a little bit just when he walked in, just how it's good to be here. Yeah. You know, because we... We get to be around people that think like we think, and, and the world doesn't look like we look, so, you know, we need, we need this, a place to be built up, and can y'all hear me? Yeah. Am I loud enough? <clears throat> I know I'm going to get checked on that later, so, <laughs> so uh, but yeah, it's good to be in the house of God, and it's good to be with my family. Yeah. Uh, I've been in church for a long time, been raised in the church, 
And uh, church, for me, is, is life. Yeah. Uh, and it is for a lot of you. I know, I know in my audience tonight, and some of you guys are new, and I don't know you that well, but I can tell you, church has been something that shaped me, uh, being involved and engaged and around believers. It's helped me to grab a hold of some things and, and put them in my life. You know, you, it helped me change my life from a young, a young guy, and I hope that, that tonight that that there's something that I'm saying here, you can grab a hold of it like it's in me, like like the Holy Spirit lit it up for me. And so, you know, I will say that if anybody has an offering tonight, y'all can give that later at the end of service. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just ask the Holy Spirit, just come in the room with us. He's already here. I feel his presence. But I, I hope that tonight that, that the word becomes a rhema to you, in a sense. Like God will just speak something and give you something. It's like, oh, I hadn't quite heard it like that before. I hadn't, I hadn't quite got it like that. So that's my goal, not to you to hear my voice, but to hear and listen for the Holy Spirit. So tonight, Holy Spirit, will you just speak through your word? Lord, help me to convey every word uh, that you've given me uh, to your people. And Lord, help us to listen in a way maybe we've never listened before. Uh, just to hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, uh, I'm going to go a couple places tonight, but have you ever been in a place, have you ever found yourself in a, in a spot in life um, where you knew that you just didn't have enough? Like, you didn't have enough knowledge for what you were facing? Maybe you didn't have enough supply. Or resources. Maybe you didn't have enough money for something you were facing. Um, maybe, I mean, I found myself many times throughout life facing things where I knew that what I had wasn't enough. And um, I'm going to start out with a little bit of testimony from when I was a young guy. But in, I found myself in one of those places at an early age. I was young. I was a teenager, 15, 16 years old. But in that point in my life, I was already thinking about what God, what I was going to do in my life, you know, where I was going. And uh, I found myself kind of struggling in school. I remember, I remember this. Uh, I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to go too much into this, but I'll give you a little bit of this testimony to remind you of it because a lot of you have heard it before. But I found myself thinking, I'm not smart enough. Like, I, I don't have the, the mind to, to do the things I need to do. And so I, I compared myself to my father. So my father, to me, he just knew how to do everything. He was good at a lot of stuff. He amazed me with the things that he could do. And I judged myself based upon him sometimes. And I thought, I don't know if I can do this next step. I was thinking about life. I was thinking about getting out on my own. I was thinking about marriage. I was thinking about work. All those things that a 16 or 17-year-old guy was starting to begin to think about. And I got to thinking about that stuff, and I know that I was not ready. I didn't have what it took, in my opinion, to face where I was headed. <clears throat> and so I remember... Guys, I got the verses in kind of under things, but in James, if you'll throw that up. Um, but I remember as a youth just getting a hold of God's word and starting to let the word change me a little bit and really just absolutely going all in and believing it. What God said is what it, what it meant. And so I was, <clears throat> I was reading this, and I wasn't persecuted, but it, I was reading this right here in James. It says, My brother, encountered all joy when you fall into various trials and knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfected and completed, lacking nothing. And, I, and it, verse 5 just really come alive to me at that, that point in my life when I was like 15, 16, 17 years old, somewhere right in there. I remember being on my bedroom floor saying, Father, I like wisdom and I need it. And I asked him for it. And I did not doubt that he would give it to me. Now, it didn't happen immediately for me, uh, but... My grades started getting better. Things seemed to get a little bit easier as I got to go on. And then as I began to work my senior year, I got an opportunity to work with an electrician. And uh, all of a sudden this interest sparked into that. And I've, I've said this to some of the, the older people that know me before, but it was like that summer I, I, I got interested. Like, okay, this is something I think I'm supposed to do. And I, up until then, I was a BC guy in school. To be honest, I, I, didn't make, I, I didn't make the honor roll, but maybe a few times. But I was not a great student, and Big E was one of my teachers, so he'd tell you a little bit about me. But, <laughs> but that summer, I sat down, I was working hard, I started to, 
to think about electrical. And if I asked you guys, how do the wires in this room work? How is it all connected? How does, it, how does the power source get there? What does it do? Most of you probably go, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I knew how to run some wires, but I did not know how to put it together. But over a week period of time, it's like my mind lit up. And from that day on, for a period of time, God gave me grace to have a photographic memory of what was going on. And all of a sudden, all that stuff, I just absorbed it like a sponge. And it was like I, I did have a photographic memory. I'd lay in bed at night, and everything I had seen during the day would be in my mind. All the prints, I could remember everything. I'd go into the house the next day that I was working on and go right back to work and know exactly where I was and just go, go for it. And I had never had that before in my life. God did a miracle in that moment for me because he provided for me, and he cares. And if we just believe and we bring what we have to him, oh, man. That's where it starts. And so that's where I'm kind of going tonight. I want to talk to you about um, bringing what you have uh, and just having the faith to, to let God do that. So we're going to look at, I got a lot of scriptures, and I'm going to try not to bore you. Um, I know that, uh, that sometimes I, my tone and the way I talk might mock more people. So we're going to read a lot. Don't let the scriptures up there scare you. Man, I got a pile of them in the back. But Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about, um, or we're going to really delve into uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and the miracles that Jesus did there. But I want you guys for a moment to take a minute to think about this differently. I don't want us to just read the word tonight. I want you to stop for a minute. And I'm going to try to paint a picture of exactly what was going on before and after and where it was that the miracle happened or the event happened. So tonight, instead of just listening to me and reading the Word, I want you to, if, if you have to close your eyes, I'm visual sometimes. Sometimes I have to close my eyes and imagine something. But I want you to try to imagine the scene that day. Um, I want it to be a, 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 kind of try to bring this to life in a way that you feel like you're sitting there. Okay, so I'm going to describe some things. The ladies, this may not help. To guys, this may help. I don't know. <clears throat> but I've done a lot of studying on, on the, where we're going. And so in, in Matthew um, 14, 13 through 21, so in the four Gospels, we can see the accounts of Jesus feeding the 5,000. We've all heard the story. We've all probably read it in probably most all the Gospels. But in Matthew 14, we can see it. Again, in Mark, Luke, and John, we can find it. Um, let me, let's just read through one of the accounts, and then I won't, I won't go through all four of them, but let's read through one of the accounts. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to read it, and then we're going to stop, and I'm going to describe some things. Uh, but in chapter 13, when Jesus heard it, uh, so what Jesus had heard, I'll, I'll give you the verse before it, but Jesus had heard about John the Baptist being beheaded. His disciples had been sent out. So Jesus had sent out the 12 disciples uh, John the Baptist was in prison, and Herod had just beheaded uh, John the Baptist here. And so Jesus, the disciples had just came back to see him after being sent out, and Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded. Uh, so he departed from there by boat and to a deserted place by himself. When the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved. He was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy food themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. Jesus said, Here, bring them to me. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass, <clears throat> and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about five thousand men, beside women and children. Most of the time I've read that account, <clears throat> and I just read it just like that. And it really didn't come to life to me. You know, sometimes we do that when we read the Word. We just kind of go through it. But if we stop and we really start to dig into 
what is going on. If you go and read the four Gospels together and, and see how this all coincides, you get a little bit more of the story every time you read a different account. So there's a bunch of things going on here. Um, the setting where this is happening is on the side of the sea of, of the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a big freshwater body. Uh, it is about 13 miles long and about 8 miles wide. The Sea of Galilee around the, the sides of the shore would be around sea level, 0 to 100 feet in elevation around, along the shores. But on the outside of the shores of the lake, you have some mountainous terrain, which is about 1,400 to 2,400 feet in elevation. So out from the lake, there's some pretty steep hills. And in the background of that, those steep hills, there would have been a mountain range. And that mountain range has peaks that go up to about 9,400 feet. And so if we think about the moment of the setting, the, the Sea of Galilee is setting along, is, is, is about the width so put it in perspective, Caney Lake, from Highway 4, on a clear day, you can look all the way across the lake and see the dam. The dam's about four and a half to five miles from Highway 4. So it's about twice that long, and then it's eight miles wide. So it's, well, it's about three times that long and about twice that wide. So on a clear day, sitting on the side of the hill on the on the thousand foot or twelve hundred foot slopes on the side of the Sea of Galilee, you could see all the way across the sea. But the thing about the sea is that it's two hundred foot deep. So if you think about the stories in the Bible where the Sea of Galilee is where Jesus walks on water and uh, the, the storm can get up pretty quick there because of this mountain range. So, you know, if you've ever been in the mountains, you know in the afternoons cool air just rushes down the mountains and uh, it can cause wind to really get going. And so what I'm trying to do is paint a picture of where we're at. The Sea of Galilee also along the shoreline is very rocky. So there's lots of rocks there. And, uh, and this area is also very fertile. So um, it would have been a lot of crops there. There would have been wheat or uh, there would have been grains being grown. There's olive trees and there's grapes and vineyards about. And so this is the setting of which Jesus is out. And he is trying to get to a place that is a place of solitude. What happened here before, before the, what we, the account of what we read is that John the Baptist was in jail. He had called out Herod, um, King Herod, for marrying his brother's wife. And so anyway, he called him out. He put him in jail. Uh, again, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. And so... Jesus sends out at about this same time the 12 disciples to go and do ministry. So the disciples had just been given the power over um, evil spirits and unclean spirits. So the disciples had been given authority by Christ to go out and witness and tell just the Jews, not the Gentiles yet, about the good news and about the kingdom. And he had given them the authority to go out and do do miracles. So the disciples were about the countryside, laying hands on people, healing the sick, casting out demons, uh, and they were doing mighty works. They were doing their miracle work. So that's where the disciples are at. And then they come into the, the area. They have to be close to where John the Baptist was beheaded. Because in this account, it also says in our, in our Gospels before that the disciples go and they get John the Baptist's body and they take it and put it in a tomb. So that tells you that they're pretty close to where John the Baptist is at. Now if we look at a map or we kind of look at things, we can see that that's probably about 60 to 80 miles away from uh, the city um, where Jesus meets back up with them. So Beth, uh, Bethsaida. Yeah, I got Bethsaida to Jerusalem, 81 miles. So across from Jerusalem would have been where the prison is that John the Baptist would have been in. It would have been about 80 miles away. So the disciples are all over the countryside witnessing, doing mighty works, doing miracles. Uh, John the Baptist gets beheaded. They go 
and they put his body in a tomb, and this, this thing happens where they know this is bad, Jesus needs to know, they get back to Jesus. Jesus is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, here's, here's where they encounter Jesus. They come back together. Jesus is, himself is still teaching and doing miracles. He is healing people. Um, and when they find him and they encounter him, the disciples do, they, they tell Jesus the news. And Jesus says, let's go to a place of solitude so we can rest. In one of the accounts of the Gospels, it talks about resting. So he's, going, he's trying to move away from the crowds so he can go talk to these 12 disciples about what all they've done and then also talk to them about John the Baptist. And as they begin to leave and get out on the Sea of Galilee, get in a boat, the crowds see them. And they, they want to follow Jesus because they're just seeing him do all these miracles. They're seeing Jesus heal people, uh, set people free. Um, and so that the crowds, what I like for us to try to do is just imagine that that we're there. What's, what's going on in the crowd? Jesus and his disciples have just got kind of reunited in this, in this miracle outbreak that Jesus is doing. And there's probably people there that have been, have been healed recently. Uh, and there's people who are trying to get to Jesus to be healed. And there's a lot of conversations going. There's also Pharisees and Sadducees. There, there are people there who are critics of Jesus uh, who are... Um, accusing him of being a lot of things, uh, not being the Christ. Uh, they're, they're, they're fighting his ministry. So there's all these dynamics that are going on. But Jesus is here doing, doing ministry, and his disciples come back to him. The thing I didn't say a while ago, this is probably springtime. It says that the Passover was close, so this should have been in the springtime on the, uh, in that area. And so... The disciples and Jesus, they try to retreat. And can you just imagine this crowd of people that began to go? I, I feel like the terrain makes me think that the people went up on the side of the, the high hills overlooking the sea, and they could see the boat that Jesus was in. There was somebody watching him that really wanted to tell everybody where he was going. And they continued to follow Jesus around the coastline, the boat with the disciples and Jesus in it, until... They saw where he was coming back ashore. And so it says that Jesus, as he was coming ashore, he looked up and he saw the crowds and he was moved with compassion. So he was moved with compassion that these people were just pursuing him. He was trying to get away to rest. He was wanting to visit with his disciples. So even Jesus at times, you know, our bodies, these physical bodies need rest. Our pastors are off. I'll put that plug in, I guess. They're off having... A hopefully a restful and joyous time right now. I hope they're having a great time. But everybody needs a, a time to rest. But the disciples are coming on shore. Jesus looks up and he's moved with compassion and he just starts doing the same thing again, teaching those people. And I feel like, you know, it's these big hills with people on them and he's at the shore and he just begins to teach and heal people and tell them about the kingdom and tell them about the good news, and people are, are getting saved, and, and they're getting healed. And this crowd of people would have been like, okay, so a while ago we got a physical description of the lake. It's 13 miles long, 8 miles wide. Well, this crowd of people would have been the size of every resident in Jackson Parish. So that's about how big this crowd would have been because it was 5,000 plus women and children. So 5,000 plus women and children is going to be fifteen to 20,000 people if you just think of it that way. I don't know how many kids everybody had, but there was a large group. But if you think about it in the account, um, uh, let's see, let's go to John. We'll jump to John 6, 1 through 14. <clears throat> and I'm going to read this again. But just try to imagine that we're there. It says, after... These things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover of feast of the Jews was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, 
Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. So I'm going to stop right there for a second. Now this account tells us how much. So a denarii was a day's wage in Jesus' day. So let's equate it real quick to today. A day's wage today. What is a day's wage roughly? What are we making a day? 80 to 100 bucks a day. Would that be a $100 a day be an average worker's pay today or close to? Something like that? Okay. So let's just round it off, say $100 a day is a denarii. And there's 200 denarii. That's $20,000, right? So $20,000. How many loaves of bread would $20,000 buy? $2 a loaf, $10,000? Let's say if, I mean, the loaf is probably about $3 a, a loaf right now, right? So... So 65, 6,700 to 7,000 loaves of bread. Say 7,000 loaves of bread. And Philip goes, if we buy 7,000 loaves of bread, everybody would just get a little. So that means that crowd was at least 20,000. You know, we have to just use some reason today to figure out what that looked like. But based on those numbers and those calculations, that's pretty close to what they were looking at. And I, I, that, isn't it funny? If you think about what Jesus was doing, have you ever been tested? Yeah. Like you feel like you just walk into a test? Yeah. Well, it, that, that's what should get us excited as we get older and, and we walk as Christians when we see a test and we realize I'm walking in a test. Man, that ought to feel good. Yeah. It does because you know that God's trying to do something. And so if you listen to, and you go back, and I encourage you to read the four accounts of this yourself and start imagining what's going on. But Jesus had said in Matthew, when, whenever they said, what are we going to do all of these people? Send them away, Lord, because they need to go back and buy bread on their own. He said, they don't need to go away. You feed them. That's what he told some of the disciples. Like, you feed them. And they're looking at that crowd. Think about that for a second. You're looking at all of Jackson Parish, and Jesus just said, feed them. <laughs> How would you do that, Aaron? <laughs> In Mark, it's the same. They don't need to be sent away. You feed them. In Luke, it's the same. They don't need to go away. You feed them. You know? In John, he talks to Philip, and he messes with Philip a little bit. It's like, how are we going to feed? Where are we going to buy enough bread for all these people? This is Jesus talking to his disciples, so that kind of helps you. When you start thinking about Jesus, Jesus had a sense of humor in a sense. I think he did because he was like, how are we going to feed all these people? When he knows the miracle, it's like we're messing with our boys. You know, it's like, how are we going to do that, man? And our sons are looking at something going, I have no idea how we're going to do this. <laughs> our daughters are doing the same thing with moms. Y'all are teaching them something, and you know the answer, but they don't have a clue. And you're like, how are we going to do this? And they're starting to try to figure out, how are we going to do this? But Jesus already knew the answer. He already knew what he was going to do. So what was he doing? He was testing them. He was testing them to see where they were. He kind of knew where they were. He knew they weren't there yet. And uh, aren't we like that sometimes? Like we're, We just think about what they just did. Jesus' disciples just laid hands on people and healed them. His disciples had just cast out demons and had power over unclean spirits. And then they look at a crowd of 20,000 people and go, well, we can't feed these people. <laughs> Where are we going to get that bread from? Isn't that funny? But isn't that us? I guess me sometimes. Because I face something new. Like I, I'm, I'm out of my box in a sense and I'm in a new place and, I'm, and God's brought me somewhere and he's like, okay, get it done. And you're like, I can't do that. Yeah. Like it's bigger than me. How many of you are facing something that's bigger than you? Yeah. Yeah. I know I have faced it so many times. Things that are, that are bigger than I can even contemplate handling. Yeah. I don't have the knowledge for it. I don't have the ability or the resources for it. In my mind, I don't. I don't. I maybe don't even have the nerve for it. 
you know, because my mind hasn't wrapped around it yet. But God's got us to this point. He's got somebody here is supposed to hear what I'm saying or either somebody that's going to watch this is supposed to hear this because God will take what you have and do things that will blow your mind. That's right. You know why we know that? I mean, let's look again at the end of this. 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brothers, said to him, There is a lad here who has five loaves, barley loaves, and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was, such, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in numbers, in the number of about 5,000, and Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So I'm going to stop there again. In, a, in other gospel accounts, it says that he told his disciples to go and set them down in groups of 50 to 100. So he says, split them up. There's a lot of grass here. I want you to set them up in groups of 50 to 100 people. And then he said, what do you have? So he asked that question first. What do we have? He already knew what, what was there. But this lad, this kid, and let's think about this kid for a minute. He's just a, a kid, a young guy, a lad. What is he, a teenager? I don't know. But he's a young guy. And he's got five barley loaves and two fish. Now, guys, I thought about it like this. 5,000 people out of 5,000 men out of 20,000 people, surely not 5,000 men walked out in the middle of nowhere with no supply. Surely somebody there had something they weren't sharing with somebody. I'm just thinking out loud. But, but somebody, I mean, I don't think I'd go uh, to a deserted place Without something with my whole family. that would, And I think you got 5,000 men there. I'm just thinking like a man, but somebody had something they weren't giving up. Somebody brought an RC. Somebody had an <laughs> RC cola and a moon pie probably. But, but I'm just saying, somebody had something that they weren't sharing. But then what, what, we're left to assume some things. But imagine this, this kid. He's, he's a teenager. Maybe he's a young, young fellow like one of Doyle's children. And, and he's just got... Did he just have the faith? Did he just go, I saw God do something crazy back in the city, and I got five fish. We're fishing to go give this to Jesus because he can do something with this. Was it that, or was it the faith of his mother or father? Did they say, take this to Jesus because he can do more with it than we can? Yeah. I don't know what was said or what was done or why that child brought those five loaves and two fish, but I know that he brought them to Jesus. Now, Jesus, how many people had something and they missed out on that? Like, how many people were in the crowd that had something, but they thought, this ain't big enough. This, this is, I mean, it ain't going to feed nobody. So there ain't no reason for me to do that because it ain't going to do no good. How many times do we do that? Oh, I, ain't, I ain't smart enough to do that. And that's bigger than me. Nah, I can't do that. So there's no sense for me even doing it. There's no sense in me even attempting that because I know that I feel something in here and, and I'm supposed to do something. I mean, what is that? Sometimes we do that. I've seen people do it in business. They have this idea that God gives them and they just don't do it. They don't move on it. Sometimes it's, it's just trusting God with their finances. Maybe it's just trusting that he can use a broken person like you to meet the needs of people, to just tell your story. You could put so many things in the place of that. But this kid, this lad, he just brought it to Jesus. And what did Jesus do with that? Man, he fed the whole parish, if we think of it that way. How many times have we missed God? Man, I've missed him a bunch. And I did it a lot when I was young because I was like, I am not, I'm not there. Maybe I judge myself based upon somebody else's wits and knowledge. Amen. 
I don't know what's going on there, but <laughs> it ain't popping yet. So, but so many times we do, um, and I have done that. I have uh, put myself in a place lower than it should have been because I was basing the circumstances that I was looking at on my own abilities and not upon what God could do through me. And if we just look at the miracle of this, um, and so think about for a moment, can we just imagine again, put ourselves back on the hillside, we're sitting in the grass over the side of the Sea of Galilee, we're looking across this big, beautiful body of water, springtime, it's beautiful. It's probably pretty nice. It's probably 70 degrees. A lot better than right now out here. But uh, it's probably about 70 degrees, maybe 50 in the morning. It's probably a very nice place to be. The grass should be really green. Fruits on the trees. The barley's growing. It should be a beautiful place. And we're sitting here on the side of the hill. We've been following Christ out to hear him teach and watch him do miracles, and we're hungry. And then... We see something going on, and we see Jesus in his, in his inner circle up there talking. And, you know, a lad brings the basket up with a few things in it, and Jesus takes the bread, holds it up to heaven. He looks up to heaven, and he says, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to his disciples and tells them to give it to the groups that I've ordered you to spread out across the grass. Now, that's the part, if we take a minute, and think about that's amazing yeah. he broke the bread of five little barley pieces of, and hands it to a group and maybe there's a disciple on the other side and he's handing it some that way and and there's just a circle of 50 or 100 of us about like it's in the church tonight and as they break it it just keeps getting bigger and they break it and it just keeps getting bigger and they break it and it keeps getting bigger and then they, get, they, they go around and they hand the loaf back on the other side as bigger than what it began with and they go to the next group and they keep doing that to feed 20,000 or more people. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Like God did something that's just, we can't really wrap our mind around it. I can't really wrap my mind around it. I try, I think about it, I'm like, how did that happen? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but God can do that in our lives as he will and wants to do that in your life. Yeah. I'm telling you he does. I'm not telling you because I'm somebody who has read it and I just believe it because I read it. I do believe it because I read it, but I have seen it too. Yeah. I have lived it too in small ways, but they're, they're unbelievable ways to me. Yeah. There's, there's some conditions, some things we have to do to to. to Grab a hold of those blessings for those blessings to begin in us. In Matthew 18, 1 through 4. Put that up for me real quick. So Jesus' disciples are squabbling over who's the greatest, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They ain't got it yet. Yeah. So Jesus brings a little kid into the room, a little child. He said, let me tell you something. Then Jesus called this child to him, and he set him in the midst of the disciples and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. So if you think about what God's already taught us in the Gospels earlier, we look through all this. What do we got to have? We got to be humble. Yeah. You got to know that God, we're like children before God, before God the Father. You know, and that's just how we need to be. We bring what we have to Him yeah. with the faith of a little child yeah. and just believe that when He stirs you to do something, some of you know what I'm talking about because He's done, done it and you may have missed it or maybe you're living it. Johnny, we've lived it. God's told us to do something. Maybe we missed it for a while, but then we got a hold of it. Yeah. If God's stirring you to do something, have the faith of a little child. Yeah. Realize who you are. We ain't big enough to handle it without Christ. Right. 
But because the Holy Spirit is here and he lives within us and he wants to use his people in these days to do mighty things just like he did then. And we just have to bring what we have to him with the faith of a little child. And God can do mighty, mighty things through you. If you know you're on the path that God's put before you, like if you know there's something in front of you, you're following him, you're asking God for direction, you're asking him to open doors and those, that direction and those doors are in front of you, then just trust him. Yeah. Trust God that he's big enough to handle it all. Yeah. Because if he's big enough to feed those, <laughs> those 20,000 people on the side of that hill, he's, he's plenty big enough to handle what we have in front of us. And I think that's, that's it. God wants us to remember what faith is. <clears throat> what is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is, the, it is that thing inside of us. The Holy Spirit says, that's it. I have confidence that, that I believe in Jesus enough. I believe in what I've read or either I believe in what I've seen or just seen a little bit of that I believe that Jesus can do that for me. Man, I, I, I'm not standing before you as somebody who's, like I said, well, go read it and believed it. But... I've seen miracles. I've had miracles happen to me. Yeah. I remember just right when we did this remodel, the thing that sticks out the most vivid lately for me was I was in a bad place health-wise. It was crazy what was going on. It was an attack, but I'm pretty healthy, and my blood pressure was what? 226 over 126 over something. But it was, I remember them trying to draw blood in my arm in the ER and it shot the wall and my wife about panicked because she knew this was bad this was before we really knew what my blood pressure really was and and it went on for weeks that we were dealing with this and it came out of nowhere it was just bad deal hurting I was in more pain than I've ever been in, in to this point in my life and I remember you know healing can happen in many ways and it does Sometimes we get healed because we have the faith to be healed. Sometimes we get healed because people come and they lay hands on you and they're righteous people and they pray and you're healed. Uh, healing can come in, in many ways. That night for me, I, had, I was laying there at my wit's end, absolutely in pain, blood pressure going through the roof still, couldn't get, under control with, couldn't get it under control with thousands of dollars worth of strong medicines they hit me with all at once. In the ER, they were pumping me up with this junk. I don't know what it was. Jen can tell you. But I remember being a mess, just sitting there. I was crying. I was hurting so bad. And Kenneth, Jer uh, Pastor Jeremy, Marty, Trey, I remember those guys in the room. Kenneth had me like that on the shoulders, and he was praying for me. And he was, I don't know what Kenneth was saying, but he was speaking something with conviction and power. And all of a sudden, from my head to my toe, I felt this, whew, and just like that coolness come from my head to my toe. And I'm telling you, I was in the worst pain of my life, and it just went cold, cool, like I jumped into a cold river. And in that moment, I was healed. It was gone. And it was so much relief on my physical body, I just laid back and I passed out. It was like I laid back and the guys knew that something broke and I just went to sleep. When I woke up, Jen came in. She had been with Faith and my blood pressure was back to normal. And I didn't take no more medicine. That's a miracle that I lived through. Yeah. Some of you guys have lived through some miracles already. you know. But I've seen God work in my mind and in my body. Yeah. And I've seen him take things that I was willing to lay before him and just bless it unbelievably too. Yeah. Financially, I could talk about a lot of things like that, but I'm not going to go off into that. Somebody here knows that God's got something for you. Yeah. 
you know there's something you're supposed to do. But you don't trust yourself yet enough, and you don't trust God enough yet. And I want to challenge you to just trust God. Trust Him. God's big enough. He wants to bless you. You're His children. We are His children. And if we'll just come to Him with faith, not doubting that He can do it, He has got you. He's got that job in front of you that you need. He's got that business plan in front of you that you need. He's got the health resolutions in front of you you need. But you've got to trust God. You've got to walk out there with faith and trust Him. And so as, as I wrap this up, this miracle was unbelievable. It was an a unbelievable miracle, really. And there's more accounts. The Bible's full of them. I just picked this one tonight because we could t- look at it through so many different accounts. But if you're being tested, grab a hold of this and just have confidence that, that Jesus has got a path for you. He's got a plan for you. It's scary sometimes to step out there and do whatever that is. Um, but when we give God, Daniel said something a few months ago. It's kind of one of those things that I heard, and I'm like, that's good. we got to give God something to bless. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. there's a whole lot under, under that, in a sense. But it's so direct on the statement. We do. We have to live for him. Yeah. We have to quit chasing sin. And we have to look to what he wants for us in our life. We also have to walk in, a, in the revelation that, that because of our sin, sometimes we have to walk through some stuff. But when we come out the other side of that, God's purpose in life and plan for us is so much better than where we're at that it's hard to describe. Yeah. Some of you are living that now. You, just, you, you, you guys are just, I mean, God takes things and just totally turns things around. Yeah. He can and he will. And uh, you just have to have the faith that he will. And so I'm going to wrap this up tonight. I hope I didn't, uh, I hope you got something from this. But uh, let me just pray for us. And if anybody wants me to pray for them, I will pray for you tonight. But uh, Father God, I just thank you for this house. For my brothers and sisters in Christ, I thank you for them, Father. I thank you for this body of believers that can come together and hear your voice. Thank you for your presence already tonight. The Holy Spirit's here, and I thank you, Father, that you're implanting and lighting your word up in people's hearts. Lord, guide us and lead us as we go forth this week, the rest of this week, uh, that we might shine our light on somebody and that your plan for our life may come alive. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.